In my talk today, uh, I'll first um, provide a brief overview of what I think people represent when they reason, namely mental models. Um, and in fact, you've, you've heard uh, other summer school talks uh, about mental models. I think Ruth Byrne talked about them, uh, Jeff Goodwin, Henry Markovitz, and in fact, uh, Marco Ranyi is going to be talking uh, about them tomorrow. Um, so uh, instead of spending a whole lot of time on them, I'm just going to briefly review the things that you need to understand uh, in order to sort of compute with mental models. And then I'll describe a system uh, called mReasoner to sh and, and show you how it works. Um, I'll show you how to apply mReasoner's algorithms to experimental data. And then finally, I'll conclude uh, by describing why I think models provide a central role in unifying processes of thinking and reasoning. So let me just uh, start by describing what mental models are. Mental models are psychological representations of real, hypothetical, or imaginary situations. They simulate possibilities. Um, they're iconic in the sense that they mirror the, um, the structure of the things that they're trying to represent. Uh, and what I like about them is that they help explain both errors and uh, human abilities. Um, I actually about mental models as mental diagrams. Uh, so psychologists have argued a, a diagram like a kind of subway map, right? Uh, as opposed to an image or a proposition. So it's like psychologists uh, have argued for various different sorts of mental representations. And a long-standing debate in psychology is whether people represent, on the one hand, images, and on the other hand, propositions. Uh, each representation has its uh, own advantages, uh, and each has its own limitations. Each has its own sort of methodologies of processing. Uh, but me and mental models, like diagrams, uh, share many of the advantageous uh, aspects of uh, images and propositions. And they provide a unified, uh, plausible representation for simulating and reasoning about the world. <clears throat> so uh, like images, models are iconic in the sense that they mirror uh, the relations that exist in the world. The problem with propositions is that they're highly abstract. Um, they, uh, they need to be fed a lot of world knowledge to do simple things like make transitive inferences. Whereas in a model, just like uh, in an image, uh, if you want to know that, say, um, the uh, University of Quebec at Montreal is north of, say, McGill, all you need to do is scan the model, just the way you might scan an image. Right? You can't do that with propositions. No scanning procedure. Um, so with models and images, in order to make transitive inferences, in order to make other sorts of inferences, you just scan the model. Um, like images, uh, models are also coherent. That is, you can't have a model of conflicting information. You can't have a model where, say, Mont Royal is simultaneously to the east and to the west of Rosemont. That just doesn't make sense. Uh, but unlike, uh, unlike images, models are discrete. right? Um, and so they demand novel methods of processing them. Models can also contain, unlike images, symbolic information. So for example, in a diagram like this, you have uh, different colors marking the different uh, lines of, of the subway routes, uh, the metro routes. So that is symbolic information. And you can include that in a diagram in a model, but you can't, uh, you can't include that in images. Um, Negation is also a type of symbol that, uh, that people use often uh, a lot in their reasoning, and, um, and you can't sort of represent that through imagery. So models are similar to mental diagrams, and they've been used to explain uh, patterns of inference across many different domains of reasoning. As I mentioned, uh, Ruth Byrne earlier uh, in this series of talks uh, talked about counterfactual reasoning. Uh, Jeff Goodwin, uh, Henry Markowitz talked about conditional reasoning. And tomorrow, uh, Marco Ranyi is going to be talking about spatial reasoning. In this talk, I'm actually going to be talking about quantificational reasoning, reasoning with quantifiers. Um, but models apply to other domains as well. And the heart uh, of all of these accounts are three main assumptions. One I've already talked about. The, the first assumption is iconicity. Um, models are iconic, but they can also contain symbols. Uh, the second fundamental uh, assumption is parsimony. People usually just construct one initial model. And so problems that require uh, additional models end up being more difficult. Um, mental models theory also uh, concerns dual processes. People's uh, intuitive processes construct initial models, uh, but those initial models are error prone. And so to correct those responses, they need to deliberate. They need to, say, find a counterexample or an alternative model. Um, and so what they do is they revise that initial model in systematic ways um, in order to deliberate. 
So one of the main goals of the mental model, uh, of the model theory, is to explain the mystery of why some reasoning problems are more difficult and, uh, than others. So let me explain how models can help. Uh, here's an example using a, a very simple problem that almost everybody gets correct uh, in, in reasoning about quantifiers known as uh, immediate inferences. Um, so suppose I tell you that the following statement is true. Uh, all of the servers are students. Right. A mental model of the statement can be depicted uh, in uh, a diagram like this. Right. Each row in the diagram reflects uh, a different individual. And so this is different from kind of set theoretic representation or a, um, or sort of a unify, uh, um, universally quantified logical expression. You're actually representing every, uh, you know, a small set of individual, uh, individual people. The way you draw inferences is by scanning the model. So if I ask you something like, is it possible that all of the students are servers, uh, and you represent a model like this, uh, the correct answer is yes. And all I need to do to it is to scan the model and see what's possible. See that uh, all the students can indeed, indeed be uh, servers. Right. Uh, since the conclusion in this question is true in the model of the premises, the problem should be easy. Instead, I gave you the same uh, premise, uh, and you constructed the same initial model. But this time I asked you, is it possible that some of the students are not uh, servers? Right? That relationship isn't represented in that initial model. Uh, and so an intuitive response might be no. Uh, and in fact, some, some people make this response. But the correct answer is yes. Uh, and the way you get it is by revising that model uh, in such a way that preserves the relation in the premise. So, in this revision, I just made two small changes. It still represents the fact that all of the servers are students. This, this model represents the situation in which all the servers are students. But so, uh, it also, uh, by changing this slightly, it also represents that some of the students are not servers. OK. Uh, so in other words, the right answer is yes. But because it took some additional processing, it should be more difficult. That's actually what we find. Uh, essentially, the uh, this is just uh, you know some some data from a study that we uh, ran, and essentially the first model can be solved with just the initial model, while the second model uh, required the reasoner to build an initial model and then revise in some way. So it required multiple models. So the theory makes a qualitative prediction that turns out to be corroborated by the data. Um, it's, it's worthwhile to pause for a second and just ask you know one thing I wanted to highlight is uh, about this example the task itself. Something like, you know, is it possible that this conclusion holds? Right. Um, it's obviously not the only task that you can ask reasoners to carry out. In fact, it's not even the most common task that psychologists ask uh, um, sort of reasoners to carry out. There's a, a whole list of tasks that you give to people. Right. Here are some other inf uh, inferential tasks that you can have people do. So, uh, given a particular conclusion, is it necessary that that uh, conclusion, that, that proposition holds? Uh, are um, these premises, are, if I give you a set of premises, are they all consistent? They all hold at the same time. Um, if I give you a set of premises, I can simply ask, you know, what follows? G you know, generate a response. I can also ask, you know, what's the probability that this, uh, um, that this premise holds, or, or this conclusion holds, or, you know, is, is this uh, conclusion probable? Right. Um, and one of the goals of the model theory is actually to be, and actually one of my overarching computational goals. Uh, yes, sorry, do you have a question? Yes, I'm sorry, I'm still studying. Oh. Sorry, could, could you speak up? So if this is the first model that's presenting, yes. right, then this uh, conclusion you can't, is, is not evident in that model. Is it possible that some of the students are not servers? You can't scan the model. It's not there. Right? In, in this particular representation, provided that this is the initial model that people build, you need to change this in some way to see that it's possible. You change it in a way that still renders this, uh, the, the premise true, but sort of is an alternative model. What's that? What's the representation is the model, not the data. Yeah, this representation is, is the model. Okay. Right. This is the theoretical represent this is what we're hypothesizing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Um, so 
let me, uh, I was talking about tasks here, and um, one of the goals of the, mo uh, the model, in fact, um, my overarching computational modeling goal is to be able to explain um, the, the processes by which people carry out all of these separate tasks, right? Um, and also to explore when those processes break down and how those errors can be mitigated. The empirical work that, uh, that people have done uh, for many years now begins to sketch out answers to how people might carry out these tasks um, with models. But as uh, Alan Newell famously said, you can't play 20 questions with nature and win. You need to build complete systems and ground your theoretical claims in uh, executable processes. Um, so that's what I'd like about next. Um, over the past few years, my colleagues and I have been building an integrated, unified implementation of the model theory of reasoning called mReasoner, which stands for model-based reasoning. Um, it's available for download and periodically updated, so you're welcome to try it out. By the way, it's in perpetual data, so if you, uh, it's in perpetual uh, beta, so if you happen to break it, email me and let me know. Um, but let's see how we can uh, go about turning a theory of how people reason with mental models into a working algorithm. So let me focus uh, the, on the task for, for the moment on uh, deciding whether something is possible or not, right? Here's a schematic diagram of how uh, M, the mReasoner system uh, implements the task, right? So the task is to decide if one or more premises, uh, given one or more premises, a particular conclusion is possible. What the system does is it parses those premises uh, uh, and, and builds up a model uh, in which all of the premises are true. If the conclusion uh, and the premises both hold in the model, then M. Reasoner responds that, yes, indeed, the conclusion is possible. If the conclusion doesn't hold, then it has two options. Either it responds, no, the conclusion isn't possible, um, which for some situations might be uh, erroneous, uh, or engages in a search for counterexamples. Um, so the question is, what does this search look like? Um, Center examples or alternative models primarily involves making minor changes and revisions to the initial model that the system constructs. These minor changes come in a variety of different patterns or, or strategies. We actually know about strategies from some studies of Bucciarelli that essentially provides a taxonomy of different um, uh, techniques that people use to, to modify their initial models. So in a moment, I'm going to show you um, an example of two such strategies. But anyway, if the system uh, searches all of its strategies, uh, if the system tries all of its strategies to search for models and can't find a model uh, in which the conclusion holds, it responds that no, this, uh, this situation is indeed impossible. Or like I said earlier, in the degenerate case in which it tries zero uh, strategies, it, uh, it doesn't engage in any kind of search, it also responds that you know, something's not possible. Um, so this loop of operations here, where the system checks a conclusion, uh, whether a conclusion holds and modifies the model if it doesn't, constitutes a search for counterexamples. So I wanted to point out that this is not the way search is usually performed in artificial intelligence, which is highly efficient and psychologically implausible. Right? Instead, it takes an initial model as its starting point and then tweaks that initial model. So let's see how it worked for the immediate inference uh, problem that we looked at before. The problem was all of the servers are students. Is it possible that some of the students are not servers? Right? And we start up by putting a model of this premise, uh, namely uh, this, this model. Uh, and by default, the system, uh, and, and so by, um, the system doesn't search for counterexamples. And so it tries zero search strategies. And so it responds that, in fact, it's not uh, possible that some of the students are not servers. Um, but Emory's search system can be enabled. You can override that default parameter setting to engage its deliberative system. And once that system is engaged, it goes through a series of different psychologically motivated strategies for modifying the initial model. It might try uh, to, say, break some properties uh, apart from uh, certain individuals. So here's what that looks like. Here's a sort of breaking strategy. It might try this strategy of um, sort of isolating in dual, uh, then removing the property of being a student from this particular individual and creating a new individual um, that's just a student, right? Uh, in this case, some of the students uh, are not servers, but there's a slight problem with this strategy, um, which is violates the initial premise. In other words, the stipulation was that the conclusion is possible if it holds in a model of the premises, but this isn't a model of the premises. So this breaking strategy won't cut it. 
So it goes back to the drawing board, resets the model, uh, and now another thing we can do a strategy of adding uh, different sorts of individuals. Um, we can just add an individual that's a student, and then check if the conclusion and the premise uh, both hold. Uh, they do. So the response uh, yes and returns uh, that model. Again, these strategies aren't very efficient, but they are psychologically motivated, and there are a finite um, number of them which we can uh, you can read about uh, elsewhere. Um, so you know, it's it's one thing to talk about how the system works, but we might as well start uh, at this point using it. So I'd like to actually show you how the system operates. Um, so I'm just gonna pop up the Emory's in our system. Let's see if I can move that over here. I can just see that. Maybe. Okay, so I kind of have to use this monitor right here. Um, this is the, uh, the Emory's Nurse system uh, that is uh, able to perform these inferences. Um, the way the system is laid out is, is that this is a kind of uh, a library um, of different terms that it can use uh, in, in, its, uh, in the problems that it solves. And this is a place where it kind of builds up uh, a problem and here's where it outputs uh, the, the results. So again, this, uh, this example is very simple, but um, we were using examples of, I think, uh, servers and students, but I'm just, in here, and all the terms that are loaded here, it's just kind of blank predicates, A's, B's, and C's. So let's try to translate that a little bit. Um, we said all the servers are students, say all the A's are B's. We can take this uh, assertion and kind of drag that over and build up a premise. Um, as I mentioned, this is known as an immediate inference. This uh, initial model, uh, this, this uh, problem that we're working with is an immediate inference, and so it only requires one premise. Um, the system comes, uh, is able to execute a number of different tasks, so we'll set this task to the appropriate one. So is it possible that? Um, and that gives us some space to uh, add in another uh, premise. The second premise was something like um, some of the students are not servers, right? So some of the B are not A, some B are not A. Okay, so we can find that. Oh, before I drag this out, I wanted to mention, um, just for brevity's sake, to make the, the output a little bit easier to read, we have uh, different abbreviations for these premises. These are uh, scholastic abbreviations. Um, but, uh, but I'll translate them for you. You don't need to memorize anything. So anyway, um, we take this, uh, assertion that we're trying to um, they're trying to evaluate and we'll drag that over and uh, and then just just crunch through this and see what happens so um, so the output says that uh, it basically starts a model it verifies that uh, some of the B are not a some of the students uh, are not servers does not hold in the models and then the conclusion is that that uh, assertion isn't possible right <coughs> um, as I mentioned, you might, you might notice, uh, this is actually just doing some intuitive processing, right? Um, there's, uh, that's because its uh, system for searching for counterexamples is disabled, so let's enable it. Um, here's a parameter that controls the probability uh, of uh, uh, sort of search for counterexamples, the probability of engaging in system two. And so we'll just, this is at zero, we'll just put it to one and see what happens. Okay. Um, so. Uh, it's basically a similar output to what you had before, except now it engages a search for counterexamples, uh, searching for alternative models that satisfy uh, some of the B or not A. Um, it finds an alternative by adding individuals and then concludes that some of the B or not A uh, is possible. You might notice that some of these uh, um, lines are in blue. The, the blue lines actually, you can double click them and it shows you the model that it builds. So for example, it starts a model of all the A's or B's uh, and builds up that model, and then it finds an alternative by adding individuals. This is how it modifies that model, right? Actually, uh, what I wanted to show you also was that, let's say um, we set this back down uh, and look at only its system one performance, draw a conclusion again. Um, the initial model that it builds is, again, uh, this, this situation in which you have four A's that are B's, right? So based on this output, you might think, okay, well, um, so that's the, let me get back to the presentation, see if I can do that. Okay, so based uh, on this output, you might think, okay, well, um, whether it's 
whether you're engaging model uh, system two processing or not, the system just always builds up that same initial model, right? That, that same uh, sort of four individuals that are A's and four that are B's. That's kind of an arbitrary choice um, that, that actually uh, helps us make things like qualitative predictions. But like I said in the introduction, we're interested in quantitative predictions. And you know, there's, there's nothing in the theory that says, in fact, people, um, the, the theory uh, says explicitly that people's uh, initial models vary from person to person, from problem to problem. Uh, and, and so this, these models aren't built deterministically. There's a stochasticity there. Um, so the question is, how do those, what, how, what governs the stochasticity? What, it, you know, shifts from inference to inference in, in building these models, right? So I wanted to highlight three main things that um, we'll, uh, I'll show you how they work in a second. Um, one thing is that you can vary the size of a model. You can vary the number of sort of tokens that it represents, right? This matters both for, uh, this matters across every domain of reasoning, but um, the two types of reasoning that uh, M Reasoner really carries out are quantificational, re uh, is quantificational reasoning as well as temporal inferences. And so regardless of how that works, whether you're representing events or people, um, the size of, uh, of a model matters, and uh, you can represent anywhere, you know, a, 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 you can't represent, obviously, 2.5 individuals, uh, so this is, uh, you can represent an integer um, set of individuals. Right. Um, also, you know, this representation looks awfully a lot like the other representation in which you had four individuals, right? So another thing that can vary is the contents of the model. There are canonical models that are the kind of default models that most people seem to um, build um, at the outset. And then there are deviations from canonicality. So sometimes people can think of possibilities just spontaneously um, without having to search for counterexamples. And so that's something, that's a sort of parameter that you can change here. And then finally, I mentioned, I showed you an action, the parameter that engages uh, the search for counterexamples. <coughs> um, so I'm just going to focus on these three parameters. Let me actually show you a quick demo of how that works. Um, where was this? OK. Um, so uh, right now, um, we said, uh, I said, um, that the system by default uh, has a probability of engaging its search for counterexamples set to zero, uh, or it ha can have it set to one. Let's you know throw it somewhere in the middle, maybe set it to 0 0.30. Um, the in order to see how this actually no sorry uh, let's let's set this to zero for a second. In order to see uh, how the stochastic modeling works, let's engage it, and then I don't know set uh, set the size to something kind of small. What this parameter does is it um, sets the, um, uh, the lambda parameter of a Poisson distribution that helps dictate the, um, the number of models uh, that it builds up. Deviation from canonicality, this, uh, you know, one, one major constraint of this is that uh, whether you're building canonical models or non-canonical models, um, it should always represent that initial premise, right? It should always be a model of all the A or B. So we'll set this uh, somewhere over here. And now you can kind of draw a conclusion and see how the system works. It starts out building, say, this model, which, uh, and then by default, it can conclude that uh, at the outset, without having to engage system two, it can conclude that uh, some of the B are not A is possible, right? So the goal of this entire enterprise of shifting, um, you know, what kind of uh, understanding the stochastics, uh, the, the um, sort of non-deterministic model construction uh, processes, is to be able to uh, figure out, you know, what changes people are are making in uh, their initial models, how those initial models shift and change. Um, now that we've actually uh, done. As, as I mentioned, this is a step towards um, getting to uh, quantitative predictions. And the, the main uh, next step is to take this, um, this sort of model setup, its parameter settings, and actually run it several times and see what happens. So oh, maybe I'll set this as well just to see some variation. Um, what the system does is when I hit this add to experiment button, I can 
sort of add it to uh, the next panel, which you'll see in a second, and then be able to run this, uh, this inference uh, a number of times. So we'll do that. Um, it pops up this kind of experiment, which just has one problem. And I don't know, let's run it 100 times or so, right? And so what you see here is uh, a sort of pseudo experiment, synthetic data that it produces. Uh, that some of the time says that something's possible, some of the time says something, you know, that this, uh, this assertion is not possible, right? There's variation in these responses, right? And this allows us, you run this enough times, this allows us to get at quantitative predictions. So sometimes people will be correct in their responses, sometimes they'll be incorrect, and, and this uh, gives you a way of, uh, of getting at those quantitative predictions, not just the qualitative ones, but the quantitative ones as well. Okay, so now that we're at the step of quantitative predictions, uh, the question is, well, is any of this accurate? Is, is there any merit to, to doing things this way? So I'll go back to the presentation. We can start to talk about some data. Uh, our question, again, was, given these processes, um, how, do we, how do we ascertain whether the, the processes that we've laid out uh, are actually true. And we need to do that, we need to compare that with some data. It turns out, um, you know, so actually what we did was we fed uh, M reasoner a battery of uh, immediate inference problems and compared its performance to human reasoners. It turns out that for immediate inferences, uh, there aren't a lot of systematic studies done on them. Nobody, for instance, had looked at how reasoners uh, infer whether a conclusion uh, is possible given a single premise. And so we went about uh, conducting a couple of studies. Um, what you hear are the questions between the system's numerical predictions of accuracy and the participants' data from a couple of our studies. The system does a good job of being able to predict relative difficulty. Let's take a closer look. Um, this is a figure that compares uh, human performance um, with the system's performance. The bars are empirical data of participants' um, sort of proportion of correctness. Um, and, uh, and they're separated by this uh, predictive trend that comes from the, um, the M reasoner working in its uh, deterministic, uh, its default deterministic settings, right? So it can classify models as easy, medium, or hard. But we don't just want to classify those models. We don't just want to look at these groups and sort of look at the trend. We want to look at numerical predictions as well. And so these dots represent the numerical predictions that uh, the system is making, right? Um, we can do this for these three groups of inferences, uh, these three groups of performance for, for these two studies. Um, and we can actually also break, oh, yeah, sorry, no? Yeah, good, that, that's my next slide. So this is on R of three, right? Um, uh, sorry, N of three, right? This, uh, we can actually sort of break those groups apart and do the exact, uh, examine how the system uh, predicts accuracy on each and every individual problem. And that's what uh, that looks like. You don't really need to you know, worry about what these different problems are, just to know that these are different reasoning problems. Um, so again, the bars show human performance and the circles show predictions of the, the computational model. If the circle is black, then what it means is that uh, it lands within the confidence intervals of the subject's performance, uh, which I'd consider a hit. Uh, that is an accurate guess. And if it's white, then it occurs outside the confidence intervals. That is a miss. And what's important here for this model, but for really any computational model, is that the system's predictive failures are laid bare. Right? In other words, you can see where it doesn't do so well. Right? Maybe there's some systematic pattern to that that you can then go and investigate. But this level of theory assessment can only really happen once you implement the theory computationally and compare it to human data. Now, this was just one task, uh, the, the possibility task. And as I mentioned, the, the M reasoner system is really built, designed to carry out multiple different types of uh, reasoning tasks. I won't really get into the different algorithms uh, of those tasks. But, you know, we did compare the system to uh, human data across a wide range of those tasks. So let's see how the system does on these other tasks. Uh, we test the system against tasks that ask subjects to decide if uh, a conclusion will necessarily follows, not just possibly follows. Uh, and this actually changes the way the inferences work, but the system does, uh, does it just fine by both 
the levels of difficulty, the three levels of difficulty, as well as by each and every individual problem. Right. Actually, this data, I should mention, this data comes from Newstead and Griggs. Uh, they had already run a similar study like this back in the 80s, so we just took their published data and were able to model it. <coughs> we also wanted to see if the system could handle the task of deciding whether a conclusion was consistent with a single, uh, singly quantified, uh, a single quantified premise. Um, that is a consistency task. And again, the system performs well. Um, right. Okay, so uh, it does well on, this, uh, on these tasks, but as you might have noticed, these tasks all have uh, uh, something in common, which is that they're all evaluative tasks, right? You give, a, uh, give the system an assertion to evaluate, and it says whether the assertion possibly holds or necessarily holds, or whether this set of assertions is consistent. Yes or no answers, right? Um, I wanted to spend the rest of my talk uh, talking about uh, a, a more important task that the system can perform, namely the task of generating inferences instead of evaluating inferences. <coughs> so let me brief, uh, briefly explain how the system is able to generate its own conclusions. See, the, the thing is that this task is kind of a mystery. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, people usually generate one, maybe two responses, or they sometimes say that nothing valid follows from the conclusion. And both of these behaviors are things that I find interesting. Um, you can kind of take a look at these behaviors through uh, sort of classic syllogisms. So something like, here's, here's a problem that we'll be focusing on. All the servers are students. Uh, some of the students are not artists. What, if anything, follows? So you might uh, sort of think about how you might, um, you know, what, what your intuitive response for that is. The thing is that the system that I described to you that I described uh, doesn't apply. Um, it can't really resolve the mystery on its own. The algorithm was meant for assessing a given conclusion, not generating conclusions from scratch. To generate a conclusion from scratch, you really you need to slightly uh, amend the system with an additional process. That is, before the system start a conclusions, it needs a conclusion to assess. Uh, and the way Eisner does uh, is by generating a conclusion through a heuristic process. Now, you know, there are theories in reasoning that will make use of heuristics, uh, especially in, in syllogistic reasoning. And our uh, proposal was certainly influenced by some of the, the ideas put forth in the past. But there's really a mystery behind every one of the previous uh, theories uh, here which is that, you know, where do the heuristics come from, right? Uh, you propose a theory of, you know, what inferences people are likely to draw and what they aren't uh, likely to draw, but where, where do all these uh, heuristics uh, derive from? In theory, heuristics are part of a much larger computational framework that's built uh, to process m uh, mental model representations, and so the heuristic system is intimately tied in with the model building system. Uh, Namely, that the heuristics that, uh, so the system builds a model, it infers a heuristic from that model, it has to, so that heuristic has to hold in that initial model, and if that heuristic holds, uh, that if that heuristic conclusion holds, then it concludes it, otherwise it says that nothing valid uh, follows. Right. So let's sort of walk through an example of how, uh, how the heuristic works. Ask. Uh, is to answer this syllogistic reasoning problem, what if anything uh, follows? And generally speaking, you know, you're not going to come up with random answers here. The moon is made of green cheese. You're going to come up with uh, conclusions that, uh, the sort of pragmatic constraint here is that you're going to come up with conclusions that are roughly following the same structure, right? That interrelate the server sets to the artist sets or the artist sets to the server sets uh, with some kind of quantifier, right? And so the goal of this enterprise is to fully account for subjects' reasoning patterns, both their errors and their correct responses, both their initial conclusions uh, and how they might resolve them. So the system builds up a heuristic response knowing that it needs two pieces of information. It needs to know what the quantifier is, and it also needs to know uh, which sets to interrelate. Right? Um, that is, it needs to know the mood, uh, as it's referred to, and the figure. So servers are artists, or artists are servers, or perhaps both. Right? Let's take a look at how you might build um, a, a model of these premises. So, uh, you might build up, um, oh, sorry, uh, what, uh, to infer the figure of uh, this heuristic conclusion, you basically look at how the system builds up a model, right? You scan in the direction of how the system builds up a model. So, how does the system build up a model? Um, 
it processes that first premise, uh, so all the servers. So it sets up a, a number of servers, um, property of being the, those servers. And then it processes uh, uh, the second premise. Some of the students are not uh, artists. And so it adds that uh, prop not being artists to the students. Um, and in other words, the, the servers come first, then the artists. So there's a particular direction in which the uh, model is built up. right? So that's the direction in which scanned to draw a heuristic conclusion. In other words, I have two options here. Uh, you know, interrelate servers to artists or artists to servers, and I'm going to pick this one, the artists, because the direction in which the models were built. Okay. And so, if not knowing anything about the actual quantifiers itself, the system should yield a response that refers to servers first, then artists second. This is the quantifier to choose between the quantifier by examining the premises and figuring out some sort of mood uh, of the premises. In other words, the heuristic works by ensuring that negative premises uh, take precedence over affirmative ones and specific quantifiers should dominate, uh, take precedence over general quantifiers. Um, in other words, for this above, um, you know, some, since some of the students are not artists, since this is both negative and specific, um, some, not all, and it has a not in it, um, people should use it as the basis for the quantifier of the conclusion. And these heuristics are partially motivated by some work by Feynman and Snedeker and Moxie and Sanford. Um, and so, in other words, it draws the conclusion, the heuristic conclusion, that some of the servers are not artists. But you know, if this is true, uh, then an equally valid response would be that some of the artists are not servers, right? It's logically equivalent. But the system doesn't draw that inference heuristically. Uh, anyway, the rest of the operation looks uh, as we saw before. The heuristic is in, uh, in the initial model, uh, and M reasoner doesn't search for any counterexamples. It returns that conclusion as a response. Um, so if the system's sample searching system is engaged, uh, it can start to pick that initial conclusion uh, apart. Right? So here's a counterexample might build up. I won't go through the various strategies and stuff, but um, this counter in this counterexample, uh, I just wanted to point out that both of the uh, premises hold. So all the servers are indeed students, right? Uh, but some of the students are not artists, right? So you think of students that just happen to not be artists. It, you know, these are, these are separate sets. The students that are artists and servers are different from the students that are not artists. So in other words, it's possible that this heuristic conclusion is false. Some of the servers are not uh, that, that it's, uh, the, the way this is falsified is a model in which all the servers are artists, right? And so once the system uh, finds a counterexample, once it's able to build a con uh, counterexample, it re rejects that heuristic conclusion. Again, it takes additional effort to do this, so this problem should be kind of difficult. Now, it might modify that heuristic conclusion and run the process again, but if it can't find any conclusion that holds in all of the models, then it simply responds that no valid conclusion follows. And that actually happens to be the correct answer. So you don't want to demo this process. I'm running a little bit uh, low on time. So I'm going to leave that as an exercise uh, and then just jump to a more important question, which is how well does this system, I've been talking about these uh, heuristics, I've been talking about generating uh, hu um, heuristics from uh, model-based representations, but how well does that system do on actually predicting what people do in syllogistic reasoning? Um, we're talking about syllogisms here. They happen to be 64 different problems uh, with sort of a structure similar to this. Um, and so, you know, on the, on the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, a couple figures that are going to be very, very hard to see, uh, but bear with me for a second. I'm going to show you figures of human data from syllogistic reasoning compared with uh, M. Reasoner's predictions. Um, so here's what they look like. Uh, on each row, you'll find the 64 syllogisms. Um, and uh, talk, and these are the various responses that people uh, that are possible that people sort of spontaneously give. Let me blow this up a little bit so you can see. Um, right. So are the syllogisms, and here are nine possible responses that people tend to give. This is from a meta-analysis of six studies of syllogistic reasoning pulled together. Um, and the way you read this is that sort of black uh, black cells over here denote uh, a situation in which 100% of people. Uh, generated this conclusion. Uh, so to, to read, again, these are all in scholastic abbreviations to make it, um, make these 
things that you can actually publish. Uh, but so um, this, this is a syllogism that says all the A's are B's, uh, all the B's are C's, what follows? And people 100% of the time respond that all the A's are C's. Uh, responses, um, you know, divide up between a couple of different sorts of responses and, uh, and so forth. Um, and so, uh, and so what I wanted to show was that M reasoner is able to predict uh, people's natural responses. It doesn't always get these things uh, correct. So for instance, it predicts for a couple problems, it predicts that people should make this response uh, instead of, and people tend not to make that response. But in general, uh, it's able to predict uh, these data points. And I should mention uh, this R is actually, you know, quite high given the fact that these are sort of 576 data points over here that it's trying to model, right? Um, it did well when you compare it against some other computational models and theories of syllogistic reasoning. So we're happy about that. Um, but there's something problematic about the analyses, uh, uh, you know, analyses like these. Um, Keith Stenning actually, uh, if you were the, here for uh, his talk, he brought it up uh, a, a few days ago and I'll kind of uh, recapitulate his concern, which is that when we pull together data like this, you know, taking six separate studies of syllogistic reasoning, combining hundreds of subjects, reasoning patterns, uh, and reasoning data, we wash out their variations, right? Uh, so the question is, what exactly are we modeling here? Are we modeling reasoning performance across populations? Um, you know, what, what's, what's the phenomenon here? Right. There's obviously some merit to doing this, uh, but we need to be able to figure out individual differences in reasoning too. So it turns out that M reasoner and its parameter settings can be used to model individual differences. By doing that, uh, we took the data from one of the studies uh, of the meta-analysis that I described. Uh, actually, the, these data were interesting. Um, it, sort of 20 subjects uh, in this study, and there were data collected um, in the 1970s uh, from 20 students at Columbia University, uh, which is a highly selective uh, school. In other words, these students in the study were a bit better at syllogistic reasoning than uh, perhaps sample take, uh, samples taken from uh, the general public. But even then, we were, uh, we were curious, perhaps there are systematic differences in these data. And so we subjected the data to um, what's known as a hierarchical clustering analysis, which ended up popping out uh, three levels of performance. I'm going to wash over some of the details over here, but essentially we can think about them as three levels of performance. So uh, to read this diagram, essentially we have the 20 subjects laid out on, I guess, the, uh, the leaves of this tree and, uh, and sort of clustered based on whether they're sort of low performers, medium performers, and high performers. Again, these are all relative terms in terms of uh, performance. They're all sort of doing fairly well, but uh, we're able to sort of, the, the, a sort of clustering analysis is able to pull out these different, um, these different groups, right? So what we did was we used M Reasoner, uh, tweaked its parameter settings, searched for the best fit to each of these different groups. And so on the next uh, slide, I'm gonna show you those data fits um, for the low group, uh, this data look like. And for a high performing group, these are what the, the uh, data looks like. Uh, there, there certainly are, you can see sort of differences uh, in the makeup of their responses. Um, and M Reasoner is able to, to do a good job of fitting uh, individual groups. Um, I'm not gonna show you this, uh, this portion, but um, you know, we actually are able to fit the data from individual subjects as well. Usually the R is a little bit lower. Uh, the correlation is about 0.6 or so, but uh, we're able to do it. Um, okay, I, I've been talking about syllogism. I don't have much time to um, talk about uh, these sorts of inferences, but I did want to mention that the immediate inferences, syllogisms, uh, they're just a few of the data sets that, um, that M Reasoner has been applied to. Uh, it can also explain human performance in set membership inferences. So things like all the Bs are As, John is an A, what if anything follows? Um, and uh, some work that I've actually done with Marco Ragni uh, examines M Reasoner's ability to predict performance across more complex inferences than just syllogisms. Um, so, you know, I think that's enough data and modeling for now. Um, I have remaining, I want to be talking about really what the purpose of all of this really was. <coughs> the overall is to build a unified theory uh, of human reasoning. To do that, Mike and I have been uh, M Reasoner, a system that draws inferences from uh, mental models. And one of the things that the system achieves is that it provides a computational implementation of the distinction between intuitive and deliberative processing. This is something that's been brought up uh, by other speakers uh, at the summer school. That is, 
system one and system two processing isn't usually cast as a formal theory, rather a framework, but in Emory's it is a theory. The distinction between intuitions and deliberations is concrete. That is, intuitions build up initial models and uh, generate heuristics, and deliberations process those models and process those initial conclusions. Um, another thing that Emory learned to do is to compute multiple inferential tasks. So often computational models just focus on one task at a time. Uh, even you know, automated theorem proving systems in computational logic are really designed to just carry out one task, but humans carry out a variety of different inferential tasks from their everyday reasoning, and we want to be able to model as many of them as we can. In this talk, it's on how the system handles one domain of reasoning, namely reasoning about quantifiers. But a unified system is really going to have to um, you know, deal with multiple domains. So some of our recent uh, work has been to take uh, all of M. Reasoner's uh, underlying sort of uh, high-level um, algorithms for various tasks and to use it to apply it to the domain of temporal reasoning, that is reasoning about events and about temporal relations between those events. Uh, and in the future, I'd like to extend the theory to talk about things like causality and to spatial inferences. Um, tomorrow, actually, as I mentioned, Marco Rani is going to be talking about spatial reasoning in his uh, computational model, which is very much in the same vein of building up and inspecting uh, mental model-based representations. Uh, in Emerson, at its core, uh, posits a general theory of reasoning errors. That is, one of the most important uh, and pervasive mistakes in human reasoning is that people overlook possibilities, right? They, they fail to consider a possibility. Finally, it also implements a theory of human variation in reasoning. Namely, it, it says that people vary the size of their representations, the contents of those representations, and their propensity to deliberate, um, as well as the strategies that they use in deliberation. So why does all of this matter? Why should we uh, be simulating reasoning processes at the level of representations, individual tasks, individual reasoners? Um, the, th this question is really uh, acute for me because um, I, I work at the U.S. Navy's Artificial Intelligence Lab, and the question always uh, comes up, you know, why aren't I using methods from artificial intelligence, right? Why aren't, I, why aren't we using theorem provers, computational logic, et cetera? Why model people's idiosyncratic behavior when we can get the right answer, right? To understand the rationale, you really need to know the difference between autonomy and interaction. The difference is becoming more and more relevant uh, every day. Um, so when we build systems, there are autonomous systems, perhaps we'll think of them as driverless cars or drones. Um, and with these systems, you can, the, they're autonomous in the sense that they're designed to do things like you push a button and say, hey, you know, take me here or uh, deliver this package or vacuum the carpet, et cetera, right? Um, you can possibly physically intervene on these systems, but you won't interact with them on a cognitive level, right? Then there are technologies like smarter phones, um, Cortana, Siri, et cetera, uh, and humanoid robots that demand interaction. They're, you're required to interact with them. So these systems have to have a model of a human reasoner. They have to be able to, predict, uh, to interact effectively, and they need to be able to know what a human is representing and how they're processing that representation, not just the linguistic output, right? Let's uh, uh, a simple example of a robot. Here's a scene from a fun movie that I like um, called Robot and Frank. Uh, if you've never seen it, it's really nice. Um, Frank, who's played by Frank Langella, uh, is in the beginning stages of dementia, and his son gets him a humanoid robot to help him at home. What's important is that Frank's assumptions, his memories, his inferences sometimes break down. And so any system that interacts with him needs to be able to anticipate those mistakes, needs to be able to say, okay, well, maybe he's wrong in this aspect, right? Let's not fully focus on the linguistic output. To do that, the system needs to know what's inside Frank's head. So, so uh, imagine this dialogue, Frank tells the robot to clean all the dishes, uh, but the dishes are already clean. Uh, in other words, for this mistake that the dishes are dirty and gives a command based on that belief. And so a robot that takes that command at face value isn't going to be very useful. Right? A smart robot needs to know that Frank's model is incorrect. It needs to compare uh, his rationale, his, it needs to infer that model and then compare that uh, rationale against its own observations. And then if the robot's smarter, it should use to intervene and perhaps correct Frank's mistake, right? It should respond some, some, in some way like, you know, the dishes aren't dirty. Um, systems today obviously don't do that. Uh, they can do some language processing, but they don't often deal with human idiosyncrasies, their errors, their mistakes, the time it takes for them to reason.
uh, because at the moment we don't have a robust working simulation uh, of the processes of inference. The goal of Emory is to make some steps towards building simulation, namely to simulate how humans carry out different reasoning tasks across different domains and to understand their, their errors, their preferences, uh, and the way their inferences vary. Um, so that's an overview of the Emory's Neuro Project. Uh, so many thanks. Uh, I also wanted special thanks to my collaborators, Phil Johnson-Laird, Greg Trafton, and Max Lotstein. So thank you. <laughs>